As a guy who has covered uh, a variety of things throughout your life, but right now on the NBA beat, uh, working alongside some of the all-time greats, when you come back to an event like this that has a certain hint of Canadianity to it about uh, uh, everyone, it's a little bit smaller time, and this is our biggest event for basketball, but how do you, what excites you about a CIS Final Eight in Toronto in a big setting in front of a, a variety of fans? Well, first, uh, I don't look at it as smaller time because I, I don't base the importance of an event on the number of people that are there, the number of people who are watching on TV, or the amount of money that it brings in. Because if you look at it from the athlete's perspective, for these athletes, this is every bit as big as it, the Final Four would be in the United States or an NBA championship or Stanley Cup championship. For these athletes, this is the pinnacle of where they have wanted to be for a long time. So... Uh, to them, this is just as, as big as it gets. So I try and approach it from that from that way too. And if you have that mindset, then you you tend to get caught up in the excitement of it and and, and the flavor and the atmosphere and the feeling that, that these individual players have. So it's extremely exciting. And it's it, this time it's more exciting because it's here where I went to school. Uh, that's number one. It's here in my hometown. It's also something that I see basketball emerging in this country uh, a way that I never would have thought possible even 25 years ago. So when I see sports and this sport in particular becoming every bit as important to people here as it would be across the board, that really is exciting. Uh, when you're covering the NBA and you obviously have conversations with people from around the league, when they talk about Toronto basketball right now, what is the conversation? Well, <laughs> You know, America, Americans never want to. They never want to. Uh, they don't want to give up possession of anything, right? So they they don't like the idea that that Canada is starting to stick their chests out a little bit and pop a few buttons with with pride over the athletes that we're turning out. You know, the back-to-back -back number one picks in in the NBA draft and the fact that Raptors are playing extremely well and a lot of college players, big-time college players right now, are Canadian. Uh, Americans don't want to give that up, so they they still kind of give a little smile and <laughs> shake of the heads. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it's just another one of those things where we can be competitive with them on a not philo philosophical level or, or not even necessarily on the athletic level, but just on a pride type of level. And when you grow up next to the, the biggest monster in the world in the United States, and we're always feeling like we're the little brother. And so we get something to brag about a little more. It makes it that much more fun. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the development of basketball in Toronto going to a level that you never thought that it really would. What would you say are some of the main reasons why basketball in Canada and in Toronto specifically has kind of exploded in the last 10, 15, 20, however long timeline you want to put on it? I think you can, you really can point to a couple of things and both involve the Raptors, but it's the approach of the Raptors that they took when, when they came here, which was, we're not going to just open up the doors and assume people are going to come because we're the NBA. We realize we have to grow it here. We realize that, that of the, the four major sports, we're probably number four right now coming in. So we got to put roots down in, in this city. And we have to let people know that we're here for the long run and we care about them as much as we want them to care about us. So they did a great job of that. The Bitsoff family, uh, the first owners that came in, they made sure the players were out in the community. They made sure they were very visible. They spent the money on, on advertising so people would see, but not just advertising the game as such, but advertising that, that their players were out there being part of it. So that's number one, and, and that took hold really quickly. But number two was the emergence of stars so fast. Very first year, Damon Stoudemire was as big an athlete as anybody in the city at the time, anybody, hockey players even, uh, you know, billboards on the, on the side of five-story buildings. David Sotomayor that big. David Sotomayor's not a big guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, that was, that was incredible to see that so quickly. And then, then after Damon, Vince Carter became an immediate media star to everywhere, not just in Canada, but in the United States. And so now we had the pride as well. Not only do we have a star, but he's one of the biggest stars in the game right now. So the, those two things made it so that uh, families and kids really wanted to be involved in basketball. And, uh, you know, taking that and running with it made it, made it easy to grow the sport here. Uh, the CIS Final A here. Do you have any broadcasting experience with OUA or CIS Athletics when you were around or no? No, I mean, uh, you know, I played, and it was the OUAA back then. I played hockey here at Ryerson. Um, but I don't have any broadcasting experience in it. I, you know, I wish I did. I'd love to be doing some of these games here. It's going to be a pretty exciting event. But, uh, you know, it's the same as the same as 
to win it over on, on the other side. They still bounce the ball and you know still got to go through. Uh, you know, it's, it's just it's going to be a great event.